Chan, he got that afro too, though, Chan. He got that oh, he got same that afro. afro. He, he, yeah. Boy, he got the Malcolm X going. He got the same <laughs> afro. <laughs> Bringing the troops. Hey. What's up, brother, man? Yeah. You, don't, yeah. bro. you don't walk like you can't yeah, fight. Oh. What's that? <laughs> hey, you don't yeah, walk yeah, like you can't fight. fight. You know what I mean? I walk in places yes, confident. Yeah, I know you walk in places stupid got confident. Got to. Got to. Got to. Man, <laughs> man, recently, recently we ran up on one of our homeboys. He had a bodyguard. We got all the way up on him. And then when we got up on him, we hit him like this. And then the bodyguard walked up and was what, what way too late. Way. And look at Chan did. Chan said, chill out, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Straighten his arms, bro. You good. You, yeah, you good. You can't do nothing like that. <laughs> you know, they say they, they say they don't believe in birth control in Omaha, man. They just. Shit. <laughs> yeah. I just don't, you know what I mean? Took, took seven? Seven. That's cool. Six and one. Damn. But you, you got six have... boys, though. That's cool. Yeah. No, I'm just saying six oh, yeah. and oh, one. Oh, okay. S six by one person. Oh, yeah, I got by... you. Yeah, six and one. Did you want to have a bunch of kids? Yeah. You always wanted to? Yeah. I was the only boy. Yes. Hey, Chan, his sisters used to beat him up like your sisters yeah. used to beat you up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't talk about it too much because they get mad at me, but I'm 72 and three. Yeah. Two of my losses were to my sister. Yeah. <laughs> and one of them, she beat me. She beat me with the antenna off of S10. Man. <laughs> Bad. Hey, off. hey, my sisters was rough, man. They was real rough. And those, yeah. those are all four of the boys right there. Four, well, four. Yeah, four no, boys, three. three girls. Three. That's okay, three, three of them. But man, see how they just got in line, bro? He said, sit back there, and they just. My boys be yeah all over the place. Listen, oh, don't yeah. get it twisted. They That's bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they don't watch. Yeah. They don't watch their daddy's hands. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> they bad. Yeah. But you know he chill too though. You can tell. Yeah. He, yeah. When, when when your resume says a certain thing, man, you ain't gotta talk a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you gotta let them know though. Before you you cross that line, you warn them. You think you are you as hard as as your mom was on you or no? On my on my on kids. kids you, nah. You ain't like your mom was. Nah. By far. By far. <laughs> By far. Yeah. She was hell. What? She was tough. She was tough. Nothing, I was getting whooped for nothing. <laughs> you did for, something. For, no, they, that's what she say. I'm going to whoop you because you're going to do something later. <laughs> hey, you so. see what Eddie Murphy said? Daddy told him, nothing from nothing, Lee. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Got to do yeah. something. Mother effer punch in the mouth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hold up. Limitless. Take a stem and cap in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Nigga, send me cap in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, well, welcome to the pivot. Uh, we're excited to be here. This is obviously the biggest boxing match that could be made. You know, there, there, there are super fights and there's mega fights and then there's legacy fights. And the fight between you, Terrence Bud Crawford and Errol Spence, it's a legacy fight. It's a fight for pound for pound, undisputed champion for welterweight, undisputed champion. And the reason it's one of those fights is because of what you've accomplished. This is Channing, I'm RC, this is Freddie T, man. And so we just want to say thank you for spending some time with us during camp. We are excited about this match, man. But just in understanding your story, but you almost weren't here, bro. It's a it's a dice game. You're sitting in your car, bullets ring out, and you get shot. Take us back to that moment and how that shaped you moving forward because you said that changed you. Yeah, it changed me in a lot of ways because I was already a troubled kid at that time. I was already trying to find my way in in the world today. But when that issue happened, it like changed me into a dark side. But my uncle, being a pastor, he brought me back over to the, the bright side, yeah. you know, and letting me know that God got a lot in store for me. And it wasn't my time to go. And that was just a warning that you got a lot to live for and just making things make sense. Mm. I was always, talented, I was always doing positive things. It was just, I was around the wrong people, the wrong crowd and hanging out and doing the wrong things. But I was always that person in the gym, but leave the gym, I'm with the homies and chilling and doing things that, you know, I shouldn't have been doing at the time because I should have been focusing on my career. But 
it was like a wake up call. It's funny, we were just joking about it, how bad of a kid you were. Yeah. How you was out there knocking knocking dudes out in the alleyway, <laughs> just having fun, six years old, knocking yeah. people teeth out. Like, what, where did that come from? What was that anger there for? And it, it's crazy to say, it worked out for you. Right. <laughs> but what, where was that anger there from? I don't know. A lot of people asked me why I was always angry, and I, I really couldn't give them an answer. I don't know. It was just something in me. And my reply was maybe my father missing in my life and him being in a whole another state and not there with us. And maybe that was the reason why I was so angry at everything. And my mom, she was always against me and everything I do or turn around, I'm getting a whooping. Mm -hmm. So I, be, I became immune to pain because you say something, you get a whooping. You do something she don't like, you get a whooping. Any, anything, you, you touch something you don't supposed to touch, you're getting a whooping. So everything was a whooping, a whooping, a whooping. So as a young kid, when I go out into the real world, this guy say something I don't like, he do something I don't like, because that's all I know. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. anytime I did something that I wasn't supposed to do or say something or anything, I'm getting a whooping. So it's like, all right, well, that's how it's supposed to be. Mm. So when I go to school and Somebody say something, mop. Somebody do something, mop. Then you get home, get a whooping, like, dang. So then it became a point where I'm like, all right, well, I'm already about to get a whooping. I might as well drag it out, you know? Yeah, so yeah. that's how it was. Is you the illest nigga in Nebraska? <laughs> Not Ooh, belly. Oh, that's, a, that's a fake movie, man. Y'all gotta stop. <laughs> so, gotta no, stop that, that's, that's to my point then. Uh, <laughs> you know, because obviously that's a, a classic movie for our culture and everybody knows that line. Uh, like, for, for me, paint the picture. Like, what is it to do in Nebraska? I'm from a small town as well. And it's nothing to do. And the closest big city is, is Miami for me. And I know when I first went to Miami, it was like, okay. This is Miami. Like growing up in, in in Omaha, you know, being in trouble. What what was there to do? Maybe the lack of led to some of those trouble. But no, we had a lot of programs coming up that keep the kids out of trouble and that you can go and do and uh, to stay busy. But Omaha is just like any other city. You got the ghetto, you got the good part, and you got you know the the ab, a, average neighborhoods mm -hmm. that you know is somewhat cool and not cool but there's a lot of things to do in Omaha when you're from Omaha there's a lot of trouble to get into when you're from Omaha uh, hanging out with the wrong people and hanging out where you shouldn't be hanging out at when I came up it was it was a gift and a curse because we'll go over here and play basketball at the park and then we'll leave basketball and then go shoot out windows with the BB gun. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So it's just like, all right, that was fun. Let's go do something else. Mm -hmm. Or let's go at the Boys and Girls Club and play ping pong, basketball, football. And then we're going to go beat up these dudes walking up the street. Like, it was always something to do. They say you shot up the, what is it, Edmondson Rec Center with a, yeah. with a BB gun? Yeah. Golly, but you were bad as hell, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're painting a, a picture for us of what young Bud Crawford lived with, what that life was like. But when we look at your professional career, it's it almost seems seamless, right? You've won championships in three different divisions. You're the WBO welterweight champ, 39 and 0, 30 KOs. But that's not necessarily how your career got started when you look at having 70 amateur fights, plus 70 amateur fights, but you don't go to the Olympics. And they say you kind of fell out of favor with USA Boxing. You don't even win the Golden Gloves in your own city. How did those experiences shape sort of that work ethic that, you know what, I got to keep grinding, I got to keep working because they seem to be trying to take things away from me as I'm wake working to earn them. Being from Omaha, not being a big boxing state, have led a lot of decisions to go against me. But not only that, my reputation. Coming up as a young kid, they always would say, and that little dude bad. Everybody always put 
things in people's head, like he's bad, he's bad. Even if I ain't did nothing to you, he's bad or he's trouble or he's a ticking time bomb. So when I got to the USA team, fighting in Venezuela in the crowds, getting into it with teammates, uh, um, getting into it with coaches, I was just that type of kid. You really couldn't say nothing to me without me saying something back or rebuttaling from what you said to me if I didn't agree with it. So I had kind of got that reputation that I was uncoachable, which I did everything I was supposed to do. It just was, you're not about to talk to me any kind of way yeah. because I had that toughness in me. Like, you're not about to punk me. You're not about to do none of that to yeah. me. You know, where I'm from, you don't talk to me like that and we don't deal with that. So I kind of wore that chip on my shoulder, losing in the, in the finals and the Golden Gloves, losing in the trials, it just it just made me more hungrier because I knew in my heart that them guys didn't beat me and they wasn't better than me. So it just made me work so much harder. And like I said, when I lost the Olympic trials and everybody was coming up to me and they got the cameras in my face, I said, it's cool. I'm gonna see them in the pros. But now we're in the pros and now you see politics played a big factor in the amateur uh, game and politics still play a big factor in the professional game but you see where I am I am right now and you see where all those guys that that they got a handout here you got a lucky victory mm -hmm. over Terrence Crawford so it all played out the way it posted so I can't be mad at how, how it played out and bro you, you brought it up which I was gonna get to the politics of it like a, a dude from the streets that at one point figured out your hands is better than the hands of the world, like you figure that out. <laughs> right. But now you have to navigate the politics. Now it's a business. Now the business of Bud Crawford is bigger than that. How yeah. hard is that to figure out? And the promotional side, like the business side of you is something you are, I call them ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Like when you walk in a place, there's people that are working for you. There's people that are feeding their kids off of you to, 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 to work the politics of what you've become. Was it hard to do it? And when do you think you mastered that? Well, of course, it was it was real tough dealing with the politics and dealing with uh, people saying that you're not worth this or you're not worth that, and you feel like you feel as if you is. So you can't tell me what I'm worth. Just like I can't tell you how much you worth. You know, uh, we go in there. We as fighters, we put our life on the line every time we step in a ring, just to entertain the people that want to see us fight. So you're gonna tell me my life is not worth what I say it's worth? Mm. So yes, it's tough. And then the, the the boxing side of it, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I haven't learned it all, but I'm still learning day to day. I'm trying to gain all the knowledge I can and uh, trickle it down to the next generation because what I dealt with is a testimony to where they don't have to deal with it. You know, I will, coach them and put them on game to where they don't have to deal with them. Maybe, who knows, in the future, boxing can be different where politics ain't playing a big factor in uh, boxing like it is right now. Talk about politics and that that's associated with, you know, all, all sports. We all had to deal with it. But talking about legacy, being shot after your fourth fight, right? Mm -hmm. uh, being shot and almost losing everything was that was that a defining moment where you said, "Look, I have to start focusing on my legacy," and then fast forward into this fight because RC asked you that this fight is a legacy fight. That's what we say. We look at it and say, "This is the matchup we all want." For you, though, is that career defining? Is this a legacy fight for you? Well, when I got shot, for me to change my life the way that I did and stop hanging out with the guys that I hung out with my career started going up. It was crazy. Uh, God do wonders, you know, and I just put it all in his hands. And yes, this is a legacy fight for me. This is a mega fight. This is a superstar fight. This is all those in one uh, with me and Earl Spence Jr. A lot of people, they writing me off because they say, oh, well, he's too small or he haven't fought nobody like Errol Spence, or his resume is this, or his resume that. Uh, there's a lot of things that a lot of people can say, but on July 29th, 
all the answers to everybody questions will be answered. Quick, I gotta ask, cause you can't go over. Bro, you got shot in the face? In the head. In the head? Yeah. Tell me about that. I've heard the story, but you get shot in the head. You sit in the car, RC laid it out. You get shot in the head. What's the rest of that night like getting shot in the head? I get shot. I duck down, car getting shot up. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of bullets flying. And at that time, when, when, when the bullets stopped, I drove myself to the hospital. And the hospital was, was like filled <laughs> with so many people that they was calling the police up there to escort people out. And I was supposed to fight on TV at that time. And I'm still telling my manager I still want to fight. And he like, man, you got a bullet fragment in your head and you talking about fighting. It's like, nah, man, we can cancel that. And I was just like, I was more mad about me missing the opportunity to fight on TV than I really was getting shot because getting shot at was almost kind of like normal because we was already used to getting shot at, but I just haven't experienced the time to actually get shot like all my other peers and all of my other friends. I think it's sad to hear all of my other friends and all of my other peers and that story is a story of a lot of people that come from places like where you do cities, where you do communities, where you come from. But we're here, man, for the fight. And we talked to Errol. And Errol has a ton of respect for you. And you're the betting favorite. We've Everybody that we've talked to around the fight, they're like, man, I don't know. I got I to go with Bud. But you're the B-side, mm -hmm. right? You, you're the guy. Even though I'm 39 and 0, even though I got 30 knockouts, I'm the B-side. Arrow says he's the one that puts butts in the seats. He's the one that makes people buy pay-per-views. What do you have to do to go out and prove that you're that guy, that you're the top dog in this? Because that's what this fight is about. And how much fear, if any, goes into what everybody is saying is that this is the matchup that changes my life. And you yourself said, nobody I, I fought is like him. Well, I didn't say nobody I fought is like him. I said, that's what a lot of people say. I got you. Nobody I fought is like him. At the same time, I can't think of one opponent that is just like him. No, I, I can't, yeah. you know? So that statement is somewhat true, but I don't know, man. I just, I, I respect Earl. I respect them. I just feel as if they lined him up very great, very great to fight the type of guys that he fought, to be on pay-per-view and to sell uh, pay-per-views. I wouldn't say it was all him, not taking any credit away from him, but you got, a, you got two fighters that's fighting. When you look at his numbers against Mikey Garcia, there was, there was good numbers. But when you look at his fight against Ugas, they weren't so hot. When you look at the fight with Danny Garcia, they really weren't so hot. So fighters fighting each other sell the pay-per-views. So this fight with me and Earl Spence, we're going to surpass more than both of us have did because we got a dancing partner. A lot of people want to see Terrence Crawford. A lot of people want to see Errol Spence. So that's going to make for a great event. It's not going to be, oh, well, I sold all the pay-per-views if I win, or he sold all the pay-per-views if he win. It's we collectively came together, and made this a big event. And yes, the, the winner is gonna uh, benefit off of everything, you know, uh, going forward, because the numbers is the numbers. But at the end of the day, it takes two to tangle. What's y'all relationship like though? Cause did y'all FaceTime and talk, talk about family, talk about business and, and trying to get this together? Because when I'm looking at you guys in the press conference, right? Like it, it was, it was fun and y'all talk y'all stuff, but it was respectful. You could tell that both of y'all understood what the other man had accomplished and what they were capable of. When you look at him as a man, how do you see Errol Spitz? Well, I, like I said, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I've been a fan. Uh, I respect him as a man, as a father. Uh, 
there's no need for me to be disrespectful to a, a fighter that's not being disrespectful to me. I never came off as I got to talk trash to this guy and disrespect him to sell a fight. My hands going to do that. Mm. All my fights is exciting. So that kind of hurting me in my career because a lot of people say, oh, well, you don't talk trash or you don't do this or you don't do that. And this is what the people want to see. And this, I said, no, the people want to see knockouts. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you say it. I can talk all the trash I want. And if I go in there and move around, pity pat, do, the, do all this and do all that, they're gonna be like, oh, he boring. Oh, he just talking, he boring. But if I go out there and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna whoop your ass. And then I go whoop your ass and I knock you out. They're gonna be like, man, that dude, he bad. He don't do all that crazy talking. He respectful and he knocking people out. We respect him. Now, if if he was to come and be all crazy and disrespectful, then now now we got confrontation, and that's that's how it always been for me. I saw a ratings video. Both of y'all talk. Y'all talking about respect, right? And it was ratings about ring IQ, you know, offense, defense, the whole thing. And you were very generous, you know, in your assessment of of him, and very respectful. And then it got to the one question, um, the one rating question. And I think boxers are kind of sensitive to this. They asked about the resume. I think you gave him a six or a seven. And he gave you a point five. <laughs> a point five. What, what do you say to that? Well, you know, listen, come July 29th, I guess you're going to be another point five that I haven't been in the ring with. <laughs> and that's, that's how I carry it because mostly all the recent fighters that I've been in the ring with, a lot of people felt as if they was gonna beat me. They felt as if I was the smaller man. They felt as if these guys was more proven in the welterweight division. Okay, so be it. I knocked them off now. Oh, this guy was washed up. He wasn't the same fighter or he was past his prime or this guy's father threw in the towel or he didn't train. I guess I get so many excuses. So July 29th, just give me my credit. Give me my props. Just stamp on it. Like you're saying, the moniker of what they, how that's painted, where Earl's bigger, stronger, he can, you know, he can bully you, but you're the technician. It sounds like it's when, it's when white dudes play sports and they always say, <laughs> they work hard. <laughs> they know the plays. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like they kind of paint you as, oh yeah, he's, he's he has a high motor. He, yeah, high yeah. motor. He yeah. coach, hey, coach on the field. Coach him. He's very <laughs> coachable. Like you, you, you understand the game of boxing, but they're yeah. acting like Earl's coming in as this big, you know, Adonis, just whatever. Like, yeah. do you do you like that moniker? And you are a technician. You the the, the switch southpaw. The like all that you do is very technical. But do you like that moniker that they put on you before these fights? I love it because I get the opportunity to prove them wrong. All these guys that they said that was bigger than me, stronger than me, was going to bully me. It seems like I was the bully in the fight. Yeah. And all of them. When I first came into the welterweight division in 2018, I called for all those guys. I called out all those guys. Only one I didn't call out was Sean Porter. I said I'd rather me and Sean Porter fight at the end because our friendship and our relationship. Mm -hmm. But set aside that, I wanted to fight Keith Thurman. I want to fight Danny Garcia. I want to fight Pacquiao. I want to fight Jeff Horn. I want to fight Errol Spence. I want to fight all those guys. Nothing happened. Where was everybody calling for me to fight Ugas when he had a title? Mm. Where was everybody calling for me to fight Sean Porter when he, when he had a title? Nobody was saying, we want to see you fight Sean Porter. And I told him that when he called me. I said, listen, they just trying to gauge me because of how you and Errol Spence fight uh, fell out. Oh, Sean Porter did this to Errol Spence. Let's see what Sean Porter can do with Terrence. Ain't got nothing to do with me how y'all two fought because the styles make fights. So then after I fight Sean Porter and then the fight goes how it goes, or he, would, he wasn't training, or he mm -hmm. was retired, or he's this. But prior to that, it, was, it wasn't that 
he was retired. He wasn't training. It was, oh man, Sean Porter gave Spence a hell of a fight and potentially should have been a draw or he could have beat Errol Spence. I don't know if Terrence could beat him. Sean too rugged, this and that and that. Even with Kell Brook, you know, even with not fought um, Amir Khan, a lot of people saying, okay, if Bud catch him, he probably can knock him out. But if Bud don't catch him, Bud gonna lose. Jeff Horn, he's too big. He roughed up Pacquiao. He's gonna rough up Terrence Crawford. You know, so I hear it over and over and over and over and over. I've always been the smallest guy. I was one of the smallest guys in high school. That never bothered me because I always had the biggest heart. So I can be the smallest guy. That don't mean that don't mean nothing to me. Yeah, he's like, I've been small. <laughs> yeah. These hands the same. Yeah. <laughs> and they big. These, the, these oh, hands no, the same. Yeah. touch people. Nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm just saying. I got some big mitts. You know what I mean? That's yeah. from catching. Throwing. Well, you cannot play no football. Ooh. I know you couldn't throw. But, you just ran it every play. But. Let's be honest, but you was in Omaha. That's cool, man. Yeah. There's no top quality football played in Omaha. You better not disrespect Omaha like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anybody Amon who Green, came out of Omaha? Amon Green would have ran you over. Stop I, playing. Did Whoa. I play Amon? I think I. Did Amon, Amon go to the nice. Texans? Oh, Amon <laughs> nice. No, Amon was nice in college. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And Green Bay, no, too. He was nice in the league. He was about? nice in Green Bay. He was You're nice right about Green that, Bay. too, Fred. Come on, man. Yeah, I'm going to give him I think I played Amon. Did he go to the Texans afterwards? Yeah. That was late. Eric though. Crouch. Now I played with him in Texas. Washington. He wasn't worth Stop. a damn. Hey, man, listen, man. You better put some respect on. <laughs> Eric Crouch was just good at Nebraska man. now, though. So, like, <laughs> let's not reach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. We came out. Tommy we, Frazier. We, we, <gasps> Tommy Frazier have, was a dog. I mean, but he from Tom, Florida. Tommy man. Frazier, yeah, I got nothing home. to say about him. Man, man we got a lot man, of people. Tommy and Lawrence. We got a lot of people. Y'all beat the shit out of Lawrence Phillips. All of them, man. Tommy and Lawrence, but hell. Y'all better stop, man. You better. Where you from? From Georgia, like, where, yeah, you know, where football is played. But that's that's also too, hey, but you can't come on our show talking to us like this because we don't box, but now I'm be respectful <laughs> to everybody else. <laughs> he's how he talking, y'all hey, better no, stop talking, playing. He, hey, he talking about, man, ain't nothing came, ain't no football came. We was bred on football. Nebraska Cornhuskers was bred on Bro, football. Bro, the only people in, they ever say. In the late 90s. I'm be honest now, I'm too. just saying. We was yeah. bred on football. But be, be real now, but the only people that ever go to Nebraska from, like, Omaha be, like, some dude named Tommy Ivasevich that <laughs> play fullback and walk on. <laughs> hey, the rest of them, they go to Florida and all these other places. They all used to get them and import them. You know, you know why? And that's, the, that's, that's crazy that you just said that. It's so much talent in Omaha, Nebraska, but they don't want to recruit in-house. Tell me that. That's crazy. So then when you see all the fight, uh, all the players from Omaha going elsewhere, other teams and shining and making it to the league, and then we looking at the coast for Nebraska like, so you don't want you don't want to pick him up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he, right. he didn't fit your program, huh? Yeah. Right. You know, so that's that's a big thing right now because we got so much talent coming out of Omaha, Nebraska, but Omaha, for some reason, don't want to, you know, recruit. You recently in-house. said your your last fight in Omaha may be the, the last one you ever bring back there. So just for you, what is it like to now represent Omaha in the way that you do and have them back you like that? Man, I, they always back me. Ever since I was a, a kid uh, in the Nationals, Omaha have always been uh, supportive. They always backed me since day one. That's why it was so meaningful me, meaningful for me to bring a world championship fight back to Omaha. That's all I ever wanted coming up was to give back to them because they travel, they support, they do they do everything they post to as fans and supportive uh, community to support Terrence Crawford and his journey to become world champion. So when I became world champion, I demanded that I fight in Omaha, Nebraska. And my first fight was against uh, Gamboa and they showed up, they turned out. And every fight that I fought in Omaha, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that just shows the support level that they got for Terrence Crawford because we don't have no NFL teams, NBA teams, or uh, baseball teams, or none, none of those professional teams. I am the professional team of Omaha, Nebraska. So when you look at 
Omaha and they want to support a professional franchise, they say Team Crawford. Wow. And, do, and you, you speak about, like, the support Omaha has for you, but also people question you a lot. Like you're saying, the whole, the whole he's a technician, but he's not big enough. You're mm -hmm. always the smallest guy. Do you think you, you've earned the respect that you're shown? Do you think the boxing world gives you the respect that you're shown? And if not, what's going to do it? Is it this fight? Is it something else? Is it a number you're trying to get to, a this and O? What's that respect going to come from? It ain't going to never be enough. You know why? Because it's always going to be somebody that's trying to decredit you from accomplishing what you accomplished because there's always a window for them to say, oh, well, the only reason why he won is because of this. The only reason why he won because of that. It's never ending. And I accepted that. Every fight, there's there's something negative to say about Terrence Cross. My last fight, they say, oh, well, who is this avocado? Like they didn't know his name. <laughs> right. Everybody disrespecting this world-class fighter when he number six in the whole division. Mm -hmm. Not in one station body, in the whole division. So it's like, okay, when he beat Sugar Shane Mosley for his last fight coming up, uh, he was a bum. So this guy, okay, well, I guess I'm fighting all bums then. Just because you probably don't know too much about this guy, that don't make him a bum to be on this level. So when I, when I, when I meet him with, with facts, then they try to downplay the facts. I say, okay, well, you get in the ring with him then. Since he's a bum, since he can't fight, since he's this and he's that, you get in the ring with him and let's see how long you can last with him. Do people not like you? Right, like, I, and, and I'm not trying to say this in, in a bad way. There's a, there's a clip uh, from the press conference, from the press tour, and you're walking by a dude in a suit. Big old tall dude, bald head, look like. Mm -hmm. And you just said, what's up? And when you said, what's up, he, turned, he turns around. You kind of walk back. Y'all have some words. And when he's walking into the door, he's like, yeah, they didn't let this suit fool him. Right? A lot of times when people have that reaction to you, you have a reputation. And it's either you have a reputation of being a badass, and they're like, oh, if I see Terrence Crawford, I got to get my stripes off of him. Or you have a, a reputation of being a bad dude. Right. Right? And, and, and a guy that we can't like because seemingly the way you've dominated your sport, he shouldn't have to ask you if you have the respect that you deserve. The way you've dominated your sport, it shouldn't be a question of who's, of who's the next guy or why Terrence Crawford beat this dude. Sometimes in a political world where we get to make our champions or we get to push who we want to push, it simply comes down to relationships and who I like. Do people not like you? You got people, some people that don't like me because they don't know me. But you got more people that like me than they don't. So the people that don't like me, I just say, okay, cool. They just don't know me. They, they, they don't like me and never even spoke two words to me. They say, oh, well, man, when I, when I, when I first met you, man, I thought you was going to be this mean, grumpy dude and this and that and that. And like, for what? Like, man, you just walk with that aura about you. Like, you just always ready to fight. I'm like, man, it's just natural walk, you know? I ain't got no problem with you, you know? Like, I ask a question and, you know, keep it moving. Hey man, it's a great week to be back with our partners at DraftKings. And y'all still have to remember, any new customer using the promo code PIVOT, a $5 bet gets you instantly $150 in bonus bets. And you get that 150, y'all, you know what I'm gonna do with it. Same game or same fight parlays. Whoa. Who's gonna win? What round they gonna win in? Is it TKO? Is it KO? You have parlays and fights as well. You know what that does? Give you a chance of winning even more money. And I got to remind y'all, it's not everywhere, but it doesn't matter. Wherever you at, they got some action for you. DraftKings Daily Fantasy, you can get in the game. Guess what I got? I got my device and my battery pack. <laughs> that's, how much, that's how much I've been putting my plays in. Go now check them out. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Five dollars gets you one hundred and fifty dollars in bonus bets when you use the promo code Pivot. You got this this laid back demeanor, man. It seems like you don't have a worry in the world, but 
fight fans and even casual onlookers, I can't say I'm an avid boxing fan, mm -hmm. right? But I peek in. You know, big fights come, I want to see those because I think a lot of times that's what the sport, you know, is about for me. Uh, and, and we've been waiting for that matchup. Now we got it. You know, you confirm that it's a legacy fight. And this question is about expectations and pressures, you know, that, that come with it. How do you manage, you know, those expectations? You said, Omaha, you know, you, there's no sport teams. You are the sport team, you know, so you got all that on your back. And this is the matchup that you've been waiting for, even with the people that say you're too small. You know, you haven't fought anybody. He got your point five on the resume. How do you, what are the pressures that come with that? And how do you ma uh, manage those? I don't worry about it. I don't worry about none of those type of things because I know who I am as a man. I know what I got to do to make sure that I'm straight. Um, at the end of the day, it only matters about my family and my, my circle that cares about me, really genuinely cares about me. Because if I was to go and get punched in the head tomorrow when I spar and I have brain injury and I can't box no more and I'm in a coma or whatever. A lot of people going to tweet, oh man, prayers, I'm going to pray for them and this and that and that and this. But then what? Yep. They're going to go home to their family. They're going to eat good. They're going to do their daily routine. None of them going to come and visit me. None of them going to put no money on my, my, my doctor's bill. None, where where's going to be all the hundreds of thousands of fans that was following me or hundreds of thousands of fans that was supportive? Where where they at now? Just a, a another boxer that's lost in the world. And that really happens to more than a, a lot. So the only people that really uh, matters when they say something is my family and my inner circle. And with that, you know, speaking about the boxers that are lost in the world, like, is that has that ever been a fear? Or you can't think about that? No, it never has. Because I always, like I said, I leave everything in God's hands. If that's my destiny, if that's the way my, my book is written, then it will happen. I'm not worried. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid of anything. Because if something's going to happen, it's going to happen. I can't control it. For sure. I can walk outside and get hit by a car just by just walking. Somebody could be speeding. I can trip on this on these stairs coming out the ring and break my neck. So I don't I don't live with the fact of fear that something may dramatically happen uh, to me in the ring or outside the ring because if it's ha if it happened, it happened. It ain't nothing that I can do inside of my control. I mean, that's spoken like a man that's been hell shot in the head um, and, and said, you know, you felt lucky because you hadn't experienced it like your peers or you hadn't experienced it like some of your friends. You said something to Fred that struck me. You said, I know what type of man I am. You walked in uh, with three of your boys and, you know, we were just saying, Fred said, hey, when you told them to go sit down, they went sit down and you said, hey, don't let that fool you now. They can get after it too. You didn't have a father there every single day. It was your mother, Deborah. It was your, your two sisters. But you have your family. You have your seven kids. It's the, the famous post of your daughter losing her shoe, getting her shoe back on, going out and winning the 200. And you talked about the perseverance and the grit that it took. How has your experience shaped how you are as a father? Oh, man. Oh, it, it, it shaped me into the greatest father ever. I, I, I really believe wholeheartedly, like there's no person walking this earth that can touch me on this fatherhood. And that's how I'm supposed to feel. That's how any any real father that, that loves to be a dad should feel. I'm there every step of the way. I'm training for the best, I mean, the biggest fight of my career yet and still. My son up here, it's his birthday, and I'm like, what you want to do? Today is all about you. I'm going to do my little workout, and everything else is, is yours. Anytime my kids have any wrestling tournaments, birthdays, anything special, anything 
that's real significant, I'm packing up and I'm leaving. Boxing can wait, but them kids, they're going to remember that and they're going to cherish that for the rest of their life. They're going to always sit there and say, no matter what my dad was doing in life, he always made sure he was there for my birthdays, Christmases, big events, uh, my big tournaments, my wrestling tournaments, things like that. And that's something that I really cherished when I was little because I didn't have nobody there. My mom wasn't there. My dad wasn't there. I didn't have nobody there. I used to sit around and look at all the, the fighters and they family and they supportive system. And I just had the coaches and my teammates. But like I said, that them experiences made me the, the man that I am today. And I wouldn't take it back. The, it's really the generational curse yeah. right. of changing it. What you've seen, you either see it and agree with it or you disagree with it. And what you saw, you disagree with that as a father not being there. So now I'm going to be there. And that's yeah. beautiful. We talk about a lot in this show. Man, I got to ask you about because one thing everybody talks about is how you can jump in the, you know, um, right hand and go southpaw and go back and forth. And that's one of your strengths. Is that strategic at all? Or does it just does the fight come to you? Because everybody talks about your instincts. And mm -hmm. I've seen you. I, I just watched it on the way over here in this corner. And the dude rushed you. The little Spanish dude rushed you. And you jumped out of it, got him, and hit him in the back of beak and <laughs> laid him down right there. And I was like, was that, did you know that was coming? Is, is, that, is that switching back and forth? Do you say first round, second round, I'm going to do this, third round, I'm going to give him this? Or is that just how the fight comes to you? Uh, it's just instincts. It's just how, how, how things is playing out. Sometimes I may feel I have a better advantage in the southpaw stance. Sometimes I feel like I have a better advantage in the orthodox stance. I've been doing it all my life. I used to get yelled at and in trouble for actually doing it. Um, but once I messed up my right hand for fighting in school, I just started practicing more on my left because at the time, my left wasn't as strong as my right because, <laughs> you know, I'm right-handed and I always want to hit with the right, but my left became stronger than my right. You know, so now I'm evenly powerful with either hand. So now it's just it's deadly, whichever way, way I go. Chan often talks about how he strengthens his right hand oh and his left hand. <laughs> oh my god! Right? It's, 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 just, it's just something he said. Who, it's called the, the left's called the stranger. Yeah, he said, "Who can they love don't come him around a lot? Who can love him more than himself?" <laughs> you know, we were talking about your kids, but you got a lot of kids, man. Like, and you talk about switching stances and doing that. Are you ever going to switch up? your kid making motto because you don't how many you want to have man i think i'm done man. <laughs> you gotta even it out you got four boys i know i'm three I'm probably, girls i'm probably done Get the eight pack <laughs> I, I tell you if you're not done until you do something about getting <laughs> done. so let me ask you this then i ain't getting clipped why not Damn. they don't live that long who don't who them people that be getting clipped I just got clipped. Ooh, man, you better well, do the research. It's 47. I made it. 47. Yeah, 47. We all, so all, all of us, none going. of us make, can make babies anymore, but we're cool. still here, man. Hard to, y'all. <laughs> but but if, you don't, if you don't do something about it, it's going to be number eight, number nine, number 10. It's going to start lining up like your stoppages. Wait, what you say? Hey, what you say? What you say? But hey, if you get out of line, he going to be the 11th hey, one look, stop. If you man, keep I'm, getting out of line, it's going to be the 11th one you got to take care of. Yeah, maybe. I think all my all my kids except one was playing though. Okay. All of them. So I'm pretty good at, you know, doing what I do. <laughs> so <laughs> you pretty you got seven. You yeah, feel that yeah. tingle, man. You I know you quick. Your hips ain't quick though. <laughs> no. You gotta man. throw them. <laughs> Boy, yeah, you gotta I throw got, them hips back. So man, I gotta do some hip thrust. <laughs> <laughs> so check it. July 29th, Las Vegas, Nevada. Fish fry. You posted Definitely. it on your 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 Instagram. Definitely. What are we serving? Crawfish or shark bites? Man, listen, I don't, I don't even eat crawfish. So, you know, we, we about to fillet them. You know, you say, you say you can't catch Moby Dick with a fishing pole, though. Listen, if he Moby Dick, then I'm gonna just have to send my friend, you know, go get him. Yeah, you gonna have to go, you gonna have to be Ahab. Like huh? that, Ahab was the only one that he, he put yeah. it, he dedicated his life. Oh, to catch a movie there. He said he ain't no little fish. He ain't the biggest fish. And earlier, too, Listen, I caught something you said, by the way. 
You know, you know what an orca is, right? A what? A orca. Yeah. They what eat is? up Moby Dick. Are you killer whale? Huh? You a killer whale? Would I? So, I have a, so this is my question for you, though. <laughs> earlier, Swag earlier you room. said, you started to say, I'm pre- when you're talking about your kids, I'm preparing for my best, you're about to say my best fight. And then you said, for my biggest fight. Yeah. You don't think he's the best fighter you've ever fought? Could be. Look at all the interviews of Terrence Crawford. They asked that same question. Is this your toughest task? Is this your biggest fight? I don't know. Till I get in the ring. I can go in there thinking you the monster, you Moby Dick. <laughs> and I go in there and you like a little strawfish. I'm like, man, this wasn't even that, that hard. Not saying that he's an easy fighter because none of these fighters is easy. They may look easy on the outside, but all the training, all the things that us fighters go through and put our body through to get to that one moment, that fight wasn't easy at all. If you do what Bud has always done and your hand is raised at the end of this fight, will you think of Mitch and- Win. Win, when you do that. Will you think of Mitch, man, and the fact that you didn't want to go to the gym when you were little, he come to the house and get you. Your mom, you be telling your mom that you don't want to go and she say, nah, he in the house, come get him. You know, I know in 2018, uh, you know, you lost him. And I'm sure this is something that he always believed you could become. Mm -hmm. And you now get to that moment. He obviously won't be here. Will you look back and think about all of those sacrifices and ways that he poured into you that helped you become this Terrence Crawford? Always, always, I always think of him. I think of him, my uncles, my aunts. I always think of all of them because it kind of hurt that they they not here to actually see the grown addition of Bud. They only remember the little, well, not Midge, because he, he was present, but the bad Bud, you know? They, they know the little Bud running around the neighborhood and none of them got to see the mature Bud, the, the Bud that's a world champion, the Bud that take care of his family, the Bud that, you know, uh, take care of his community. They don't. They they wasn't able to see those, those things, uh, in a physical form. Uh, so, I think of all of them. When I'm in the when I'm in the back back dressing room, I'll be hearing little words, little little people talking to me. And it might be crazy to people, but I just be like, I'll be looking up like, all right, I hear you, you know. And and Midge always said, never mind who he fought, he ain't fought you yet. Because when I was coming up, a lot of people will always say, oh, man, you fighting this guy or you fighting this guy. And Midge always would say, he'll be like, Lottie Dottie, we fight anybody. Mm. He ain't fought you yet. And I go in there with the mindset of he ain't fought me yet. So I don't care who he fought. I don't care who he beat. He ain't beat me yet. Till he beat me, I don't care about what y'all talking about and how dangerous he is. So that's how I always carried it. All respect to Midge Minor, man. Yeah. All respect. And Bud, you, you going into this fight the 29th. You gonna go with the with the with the Joe Clark hairdo? Cause I was giving you her hair earlier about it. You gonna go with the fro with the Malcolm X and all I you don't know. You, you ain't gonna temp, you ain't gonna temp fade it. You he went nothing. to the he went to the press conference I, like that with I the Gucci it. polo. I saw it. No but edge up just, or nothing, yeah, bud. Just a little tip, man. Just man, a little I ain't tape. trying to impress nobody, man. It's <laughs> man, it's game time. Is that how y'all say game yeah. time? But time you know they game. say they say you you look good. I feel good. I look good. I feel good. Yeah. So yeah. no ads, no nothing. You're not gonna. I might. I might. <laughs> look good. Feel good. Fellas, our partners over at DraftKings, man, they done put us in a bad spot. They want us to pick between Arrow and Bud. I ain't going, Chan. You'll do it though. I got it, man. And I love it. Bud was cool, and yeah, I love the swag. But Arrow's the truth. And I'm going with the truth. I think Errol Spence going to throw, and he ended up knocking out Bud. Look, I'm going to go with the, the knockout bet. The knockout bet. I, I like both of the guys. I can't pick a favorite, but I'm going to go with the knockout. Both of them are great. I don't think it'll be a decision. So knockout, six, over under six round, that's my play. Well, Freddie T brought up the curse to Errol. Can't be 
curse when they both did your show. Can't wait to see who wins. But we're going to ask you this and wrap it up. We ask all our guests. Uh, biggest pivot. You know, that defining moment that catapulted you, you know, or changed the direction of your life. What's your biggest pivot? The biggest pivot that changed my life? I would have to say my uncle and my grandma being there to support me through all the things that I was going through uh, as a child and being able to actually give me those words to make me sit down and think. Because my grandma, she's a gangster. <laughs> she's a they gangster. No, nah, my grandpa a gangster. <laughs> she's a real one. And she just always kept it real like, mm -hmm. what you doing with that boy? Uh, like she never, she never was the type to be like, boy, what you doing that night? She always be like, just chilling. Like, what you doing? Uh, you going by yourself? Now, you know, when you walk out that door, if something happened, you can't take it back. Mm -hmm. Like she always like real, right. like she gonna let you do whatever you want to do, but she gonna give you that, you know what I mean? To put on your mind, like, damn, mm -hmm. she right. You know what I mean? So I just always cherished my my grandma, you know, thoughts on things and how she always try to talk to me and help me understand like it ain't worth it or this ain't worth it. Or if you do this and you know you're gonna get into trouble and if you get in trouble, I can't help you get out. I like just little things like that ever since a little kid and my uncle always, you know, telling me to believe in God and um, hold your head high and everything will be all right. Everything happened for a reason. And and just, you know, walking in that in that right path, right. changing my life and seeing how things change for me and being able to go from fighting for $600 my first fight and not being able to get no no big promotional company to invest in me because they didn't feel as if I was one of those top guys to being on top of the world. Coming from nothing, uh, it's a blessing. Yeah. But are you the best welterweight in the entire world? Definitely. On July 29th, will it finally be settled with your hand being raised in the ring? July 29th, I assure you, my hand will be raised and everybody will be saying that guy is special. That's all it takes, hey, brother. You should make a baby that night. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Number eight. We ain't making no baby. Eight man. out the gate. <laughs> we ain't making Appreciate no baby, you. man. For sure. Hey, hey, good luck, dog. Hey, that oh, little joke gonna have no sir. fat on him either. Man, that joke sure. solid. Yeah, he ain't got no yeah. fat on him. Hey, how has, um, he leaning into you too. Yeah, he, he, he yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, Like yeah, it yeah. always benefited? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, be you know, he can't He can't really do nothing here. In oh, Denver? Yeah, I, had, he, I, yeah. I had a secret cell tag yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I had to snatch his whole inside out. Damn. <laughs> he, he, he hey, why are you going to say it like that? He got no organs. I got, he, he, he got well, like two organs, organs in there. Play safety. Safety. Yeah, 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 play safety. See, you ain't that much taller than me, man. I'm not. I'm just yeah. tougher. Yeah. Oof. I don't know about I, that. I'm out of that don't conversation. So, so, man. So, I'm, he, I don't he, got he, you. He, you. Like you tried to say, he got shot in the head. <laughs> you can't tell me you're tougher than me. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. sorry. I don't see a nigga try to ball up, and he'd still be popping that. <laughs> yeah, you can't tell me. I want to take his spot. Hey, you just no, know, bud. Yeah. But that's like that's like me saying but then, no, I can get no, the ring and do like yes, it is. No, it ain't because I but, played basketball and football. See, it doesn't matter you, that you, you play. You say you can take his spot, but, but then I, you got to tackle I, me. I fought too, but hey, listen, I was I was going. No, no, no. I'm nah. I'm good at wrapping up. Nah, I ain't no wrapping up. I'm that wrapping up. You got right options. You right I'm wrapping chest, up. Won't. Man, I see I'm you coming out in the pipe like I, that. And my man coming and to clean you up. Oh, oh, no. hey, he, he can break hey, you up. You go with the light skin hair? Whoever. You already told him I'm not green. I want him over. I'm saying, you on my team. You on my team. If you on my team and I wrap him up. Oh, I'm on the way. I'm going to stand up. I'm on the way, bud. That's all I got to do. But you got no shot. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, when I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, when I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the